This is perhaps the most intriguing story of friendship and betrayal in the history of African military leadership. A friendship which started out based on shared patriotic values, but ended in tragedy and betrayal. Welcome to the Sankofa Pan-African series. Please support us through Patreon and by buying me coffee. Don't just subscribe to this channel. Turn on your notification button, share our videos, and check out our website, sankofastorybooks.com, for history, Afrocentric stories, and other resources for children. In the early hours of December 21st, 1949, in the town of Yaku, in Upper Volta, which is now Burkina Faso, Joseph and Marguerite Sankara welcomed the son, Thomas, the third of their ten children. Thomas's parents were of Mossi ethnicity, the largest ethnic group in Burkina Faso. Joseph was a gendarme and Marguerite, a full-time housewife. Thomas's early life was marked by poverty and struggle. His family was not wealthy and he had to work hard to get an education. He attended primary school in Yako and then went to secondary school in Bobo Diolasso. He was studious and took a keen interest in politics and social justice. Despite being from a military family, he was deeply influenced by the non-violent teachings of Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. from an early age. He was also particularly interested in history and political science, and he was known for his strong opinions and his desire to challenge authority. Although Thomas Sankara was raised in a devout Catholic family and his parents wanted him to become a priest, he had always been fascinated by the military and the idea of serving his country. The military was popular at the time as it had just ousted a despised president, Maurice Yame Ogo. Sankara's interest in politics was awakened at an early age. When he was in secondary school, he became involved in student politics and was known for his strong opinions and his willingness to speak out against injustice. He was particularly concerned about the poverty and inequality that he saw around him and he became convinced that change was necessary. Sankara therefore joined the military believing that it was an avenue for fighting in efficient and corrupt bureaucracy, counterbalancing the inordinate influence of traditional chiefs and helping to modernize the country. Another attraction which the military had for him was the fact that they offered a scholarship which was essential for Sankara who couldn't afford further education without one. He took the entrance exam and passed with flying colors. In 1966, Sankara entered the military academy of Kadiogo in Ouagadougou. He was only 17 years old and one of the academy's first set of cadets. During his time at the academy, Sankara witnessed the first military coup d'etat in Upper Volta, led by Lieutenant Colonel Sangul Lamizana. Alongside their military training, the recruits were also taught by civilian professors of the social sciences, including Adama Toure, who had progressive ideas and invited some of his brightest and politically inclined students, like Sankara, to join informal discussions about imperialism, socialism, 
and communism. These discussions expose Sankara to a revolutionary perspective on Upper Volta and the world, which he found inspiring. In addition to his academic and extracurricular political activities, Sankara also pursued his passion for music and played the guitar. After graduating from the academy, Sankara went on to further his military studies at the Military Academy of Anserab in Madagascar, where he graduated as a junior officer in 1973. The range of instruction at the Anserab Academy also went beyond standard military subjects, allowing Sankara to study agriculture and how to better the lives of farmers. He also read extensively on history and military strategy, which would later shape his interpretation of Bukinabi political history. Sankara's journey from a devout Catholic upbringing to becoming a military officer exposed to revolutionary ideas was not an easy one, but his determination to serve his country and make a difference drove him forward. Little did he know his journey was just beginning. Thomas Sankara was highly principled and he returned to his homeland in 1973 ready to serve his people. He soon found himself fighting in a border war against Mali in 1974. In spite of the danger, Sankara showed incredible bravery and was hailed as a hero for his performance in the war. However, as time passed, Sankara's perspective on war changed. He saw it as an ineffective way to achieve any real progress and realized that he needed to find other ways to bring about the necessary changes that his country needed. Known for his love of music and riding motorcycles, he drew on his artistry and became a beloved popular figure in Ouagadougou, the capital, playing guitar in a band called Tut Aku Jazz. Thomas Sankara and Blaise Campari met in 1974 as young soldiers when Campari was posted north of Uwahiguya immediately after the war against Mali. They developed a very close friendship based on their shared vision for Upper Volta, but it was a friendship that would prove fatal. In 1976, Sankara was appointed commander of the Commando Training Center in Po, a position of great responsibility. But he proved himself worthy of the challenge. Along with Kampaore, Henry Zongo, Jean Baptiste Bukri Lingani, Sankara formed the Communist Officers Group, or ROC a group dedicated to making positive change in Upper Volta. The charismatic Sankara soon emerged as the group's leader. He saw firsthand the poverty and exploitation that plagued his country and was focused on making a difference. Sankara's political views continued to evolve during his time in the military. He was deeply influenced by Marxism and saw it as a way to bring about social and economic equality in his country. He also became increasingly critical of the French colonial legacy in his homeland and other African countries. Sankara's journey into politics began when he was appointed Secretary of State for Information in the military government in September 1981. He was thrilled to have the opportunity to make a positive impact. On his first day in office, 
he rode his bike to the cabinet meeting, reflecting his humble roots and his commitment to serve the people. However, Sankara's strong convictions and principles led to his resignation on the 21st of April 1982, less than a year after his appointment, because he could not tolerate the regime's anti-labor policies that he decried in his passionate resignation speech, declaring that those who silence the people would face misfortune. In spite of this setback, Sankara's unwavering dedication to his people and his country continued to guide him. In January 1983, he was appointed Prime Minister, a position he took with great pride and determination. However, he soon became disillusioned with where Drago's government and began to speak out against it. He was particularly critical of Wedrago's close ties to France and his failure to address the poverty and inequality that was rampant in Upper Volta, like in other former French colonies. Inevitably, his tenure was again brief and he was dismissed from his post and placed under house arrest in May 1983. His dismissal was preceded by Jean-Christophe Mitterrand's visit. Jean-Christophe was the son of the French president and an African affairs advisor. After Mitterrand's visit, Sankara was placed under house arrest along with Henri Zongo and Jean-Baptiste Bukhari Lingani. It would have been a stunning fall from grace for others to be cut down from a meteoric political rise. But Sankara was made from a unique mold. On August 4, 1983, a coup d'etat orchestrated by Blaise Campauri ushered Sankara into power as the president of Upper Volta at the young age of 33. The coup was supported by Libya, which was on the verge of war against France in Chad. France, of course, saw Sankara as a threat to their interests because apart from the fact that he had been so outspoken against France's continued oppression of their former colonies, Sankara was inspired by the revolutionary examples of Cuba's Fidel Castro and Che Guevara, as well as Ghana's military leader, Jerry Rawlings. He saw himself as a revolutionary and promoted a democratic and popular revolution. RDP. His ideology was staunchly anti-imperialist and he also focused on fighting corruption, promoting reforestation, averting famine, and prioritizing education and healthcare. In 1984, on the first anniversary of his accession, Sankara renamed the country Burkina Faso meaning the land of the upright people in the two major languages of the country. He also designed a new flag and wrote a new national anthem. Sankara's leadership, though so brief, brought significant changes to Burkina Faso, including land reforms, women's rights, and the promotion of self-reliance. His revolutionary policies and leadership style made him a popular figure, not only in Burkina Faso, but across Africa. Although Blaise Campori played an important role in Sankara's rise to power as his right-hand man, assistant commander, and trusted advisor, their relationship which was initially fueled 
by a shared passion and goals for the advancement of their native land gradually began to turn sour as Sankara remained relentless in implementing revolutionary policies. Sankara was uncompromising in his stance against corruption and imperialism. And as this made him a popular figure in Burkina Faso and across Africa, it did not quite sit well with Kampari, who was more conservative and less radical in his outlook. Somehow, Kampari lost the fervor that had once ignited their friendship. Their relationship deteriorated further when Sankara discovered and accused Kampuari of plotting against him. Kampuari had no choice but to resign from the government in 1986. Matters came to a head in October 1987 when the charismatic Thomas Sankara, leader of the newly renamed Burkina Faso, was assassinated in a coup led by none other than his former best friend, Blaise Kampori. Sankara was attending a meeting with the Consul de Entente when he was targeted and killed by his assailants. According to Haluna Traori, who was the only survivor of the assassination, the attacker singled out Sankara and executed him. They then opened fire on other attendees, resulting in the death of 12 others. Sankara's body was quickly buried in an unmarked grave without any official ceremony. The haste with which his body was disposed and the lack of transparency surrounding his death confirmed speculations and conspiracy theories about the circumstances of his assassination. There have been allegations regarding the involvement of France and the United States. Sankara's advocacy for African independence and opposition to neo-colonialism made him an enemy of France. Similarly, there are allegations that the CIA was complicit in the plot to kill him. Blaise Kampari's dedication to reverse the progress that Sankara made through his own policy of rectification, overturning everything that he denounced as the leftist and third worldist policies that had been started by Sankara, have continued to fuel belief that he was a tool for Western imperialist agenda. Sankara's widow, Miriam, and their two children had to flee the country in the aftermath of the coup, seeking refuge in neighboring countries. Sankara's death brought an end to four years of glorious revolution, which if allowed to continue, would have reversed the trajectory of Burkina Faso for good. It was a devastating blow to his supporters and admirers who recognized him as a visionary leader dedicated to the social and economic development of Burkina Faso and the wider African continent. In spite of the passage of time, Thomas Sankara's legacy continues to resonate with many people in Burkina Faso and around the world. His ideas and ideals including his commitment to social justice, gender equality, and African unity, continue to inspire progressive activists, artists, and intellectuals around the world. In spite of their once close relationship, Sankara and Kwampori ended up on opposite sides of history. Thomas Sankara continues to inspire social justice and anti-imperialist movements across the world, while Kampuare's rule is remembered for corruption, repression, and human rights abuse. 
Thaba Sankara was not the first or only African leader who was cut down by forces determined to keep Africa poor and servile. The dark history of African politics is replete with stories of progressive African leaders who were assassinated with the support of the US and other Western countries' intelligence agencies. To illustrate, in 1959, the CIA set up a dedicated Africa division whose purpose was to secure America's power across the African continent using any means necessary. It's therefore not surprising that between 1961 and 1973 alone, six African independence leaders were assassinated by their ex-colonial rulers, including Patrice Lumumba. Please check out our episode on this dynamic African leader. The deaths of Africa's slain visionary leaders have had far-reaching consequences and continue to shape Africa's politics to this day. If you're interested in knowing more about the complex relationship between Western powers and African politics, please keep watching this channel. Our next episode will expose more stories behind some more of these infamous assassinations. If you like this video, please support us through Patreon and by buying me coffee so we can continue to bring you this series. Subscribe, turn on your notification buttons, share our videos with all your contacts and keep your comments coming. Oh, no, no.